I take full responsibility for my actions. I've never crossed the line with anyone. The best way I can help now is if I step aside and let government get back to governing. And that's that. Buried in a long speech where he mostly defended his actions, Governor Cuomo resigned. But is it actually over? We have several angles covered tonight. One trillion dollars in infrastructure, plus three and a half trillion more in spending. Is there any pork in either of these bills? And who pays? And with wildfires raging and massive flooding overseas, we want to know, is there anything we can agree on when it comes to climate change? We are jam-packed on a Tuesday night. The Donlin Report starts right now. Good evening. Last night here on our broadcast, we said it felt like we were waiting for the inevitable in New York. And tonight, it has happened. Governor Andrew Cuomo announced today he will resign in two weeks. It's been a dramatic and rapid fall from grace for a huge name in New York politics and a man who seemed well on his way to a fourth term next year. But after leading the state through the pandemic, he ran into controversy over his handling of COVID deaths in New York nursing homes and then faced a barrage of sexual harassment allegations. And those accusations ultimately forced him to step down today. A week after a scathing report from the state attorney general found he had sexually harassed 11 women, both inside and outside his close business circle. At a news conference today, Cuomo spent 10 minutes defending himself. And just when it seemed like he would continue fighting, he said he would step down. I take full responsibility for my actions. I've never crossed the line with anyone. But I didn't realize the extent to which the line has been redrawn. I want to thank the women who came forward with sincere complaints. It's not easy to step forward. This is about politics. And our political system today is too often driven by the extremes. The best way I can help now is if I step aside and let government get back to governing. So it appears the attorney general's report was the beginning of the end for Cuomo. He said the reaction to that report was outrage, and it should have been. But he went on to say it was also false. Add to that, his top aide stepped down yesterday without mentioning his name. It was hard to find anyone supporting him. Politicians, the polls, the people were all pretty much in concert. It was time for the governor to go, and today, he said he would. That's where we start tonight, joined by New York State Senator Jabari Brispor and Assemblyman Kenny Burgos. Senator, let's start with you. This, as we mentioned, seemed inevitable, but he did continue to, f to fight. Were you surprised that he resigned today? I was incredibly surprised uh, that he resigned. Joe, to be honest, I thought that he was too proud to resign and had too much money in his campaign account to avoid seeking a fourth term. So, Assemblyman Burgos, how, how about you? It seemed like, again, he would continue to fight, and then 10 minutes into the speech, I'm guessing you were watching it like the rest of us. All of a sudden, boom, he's out. Yeah, uh, similar to my colleague, Senator Brisport, you know, uh, my thought process was that he would fight this tooth and nail to the end. Uh, my jaw pretty much dropped when I watched the, his live uh, press conference of his resignation. So, Senator, what do you think changed? I think that what changed is that he could no longer deny that he had lost the mandate of the vast majority of New Yorkers, not only the legislature, but millions of New Yorkers who had turned sour on the governor based on his actions. Assemblyman, we talked earlier this week about this maybe being a Nixon moment. Do you think there's a possibility the governor was essentially told that he would be impeached by the assembly? I mean, I'm sure he was told by his closest aides. I'm sure it was quite clear at, at that point. I mean, it, it was really a, a rare essence of political pressure that we saw. And even just besides political pressure, you just saw the public outcry. I mean, the media. I mean, there was really no doubt that we were going to move forward and impeach the governor. So what, I think he really had no choice. What happens with that process right now, Assemblyman? 
So that's still up in the air. I've been speaking with my colleagues. Um, we're still continuing with our investigation. We have a, you know, a duty to report what we found to New Yorkers across the state. Mm -hmm. And our investigation was much broader than the attorney general. Um, but as far as where impeachment goes, uh, I can't say concretely right now. But the investigation does have to come to a, a, a close at some point. All right, we did hear from President Biden today. We know earlier he had called for Governor Cuomo to step down. Uh, President Biden talked about what happened today. Here's part of what he said, and we'll get your comments after. How would you assess his 10 and a half years as governor of the state? In terms of his personal behavior or what he's done as a governor? What he's done as a governor. thought he's done a hell of a job. I thought he's done a hell of a job. And, uh, I mean, both on everything from access to voting to infrastructure to a whole range of things. That's why it's so sad. Senator, what did you make of, of the, the governor's comments today? I noticed that he thanked women for stepping forward, said it taught me personal boundaries must be protected. It almost sounded to me like he's already working on his defense and, and sort of damage control. Uh, let, me, let me start by just uh, addressing the president's comments sure. because the governor has certainly not done a hell of a job. Every progressive victory in New York over the past decade has been solely because of the work of activists, labor, and movements. Uh, the governor has been a foil to progressive victories for the past decade, whether it's uh, disinvesting from health care, from housing, from transportation. So he has not done one hell of a job. And in terms of his comments today, it would have been nice to have seen these months ago when these women started coming forward and not when he has an impeachment staring down his face. Assemblyman, let's pick it up with you and the president's comment today. What do you think about what he said? Uh, I, I'm going to agree with my colleague there. You know, it, the governor is very good at media, at, 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 you know, kind of portraying what he wants to portray. But most people in New York, most people in political circles know that these fights have been going on for a long time. And, and the governor has really been a blockade uh, along the way, really, you know, pushing for these issues when it's convenient for him uh, and then touting it as a win. All right, Assemblyman, let me, let me get back to you on uh, one more other question that I just asked the senator there. On the one hand, Cuomo today said, I'm responsible, but on the other, he, he blamed politics. What did you make of his sort of I didn't know defense, if you will? You know, to me, I think the governor right now, his biggest worry has to be criminal liability. Um, so, you know, his comments, I assume, are him in prepare, you know, preparing for what may be inevitable. You know, you have the Albany County DA that has opened an investigation into him. You have other DAs that have asked for information on, on him to possibly open investigations as well. Um, so his comments, uh, again, I, th I think are just protection of the inevitable. Senator, where, does, uh, where do things go from here in Albany? Things can go in a number of directions. I, I do think the assembly should conclude its investigation. And if they decide to impeach, I think that we should uh, maintain and continue those uh, proceedings within the Senate. All right, Assemblyman, I, uh, I have one more for you, too. This, this, according to Cuomo, was politically motivated. But as we saw, President Biden, both Democratic senators, there were several voices who called for him to resign. What do you make of that statement that this is political? This really was not politically motivated. I mean, you know, this, these allegations came out back in March, and there were many calls, including myself, for the governor's resignation back in March. Uh, then for months throughout the summer, he continued his work as governor. He carried on as if nothing was going wrong. But he also encouraged the attorney general's investigation and encouraged New Yorkers and, and, and politicians to wait on this report. So this is a report that he encouraged, a report that was done, you know, from an unbiased approach, 174 interviews, thousands of emails, you know, investigations, and, and she came to a conclusion. And the, the highest ranking law enforcement official in New York stated the governor broke federal and state law. So I'm not sure how this is political when we've given him pretty much due process. New York State Congress members, Kenny Burgos and Senator uh, Jabari Brisport, I know both of you have uh, arranged your schedule for us tonight to join us. We do appreciate your time. Thank you. Enjoy the evening. Thanks so much, Joe. Thank you so much, Joe. Joining us now to talk more about this, Mark Fisher, Washington Post senior editor. Uh, Mark, first of all, let's sort of put some perspective on this for us, if you would. How seismic was this shift today in New York politics? 
Well, in a certain way, it was a big shock, but really it was inevitable. Uh, as you've said, the governor had lost his political base, his support from President Biden to the New York senators uh, to the uh, the bulk of the New York population. Seventy percent of New Yorkers saying they wanted him to step down. So there really wasn't anywhere for him to go but out. Uh, so the question became, where, at what point would he leave? Would he force an impeachment and a trial? Would he uh, allow himself to be in indicted. Uh, this was the easiest way to get out ahead of what could be some very troubling criminal charges. Do you think someone told him he was about to be impeached, as we, as we mentioned, sort of this Nixon moment? Absolutely. I, I think uh, his top staffers had made clear to him, as well as his colleagues uh, and, and compatriots in the Democratic Party, had made clear that there was no way out here. As much as he is and was a fighter, uh, there was nothing to fight against because he'd lost that base. He was a captive in a way of uh, being a, a symbol of the Democratic Party, which has very much embraced the idea of the Me Too moment, of the fact that uh, women should be believed when they make these allegations. And so he couldn't really push back against that in the way that a Republican might have the freedom to do. Uh, if he were a Republican, I think we could say that he probably would not have resigned today. What about the other issues that are still pending, Mark? Uh, the, the nursing home deaths, the, the funds that are in question that he used to write his book. Does all of this go away with him? Well, no. I mean, uh, there there are some very important issues, uh, some uh, you know, scandals that are surrounded the Cuomo administration. Some new reporting by the New Yorker magazine today about uh, some past misdeeds that uh, he's alleged to doing. So there are any number of pat pathways for prosecutors to take a deeper look at Andrew Cuomo. Uh, but will there be the political will to do so? Uh, certainly, if you look at the Donald Trump example, you have President Biden making clear he doesn't want uh, a kind of witch hunt. Uh, or, or attack legal assault on Trump. And I think you'll see the same kind of attitude coming from his fellow Democrats uh, saying that Andrew Cuomo need not be subjected to that. So what happens next, Mark? What do we know about Kathy Hochul? Kathy Hochul uh, was never a close ally of Andrew Cuomo. Uh, she's been his lieutenant governor for six years, but they really don't have much to do with each other. Uh, they, uh, she has not played a significant role in formulating policy. Her job is largely ceremonial. So this is an enormous leap for her. That said, she has a strong political background, both in the Buffalo area uh, and uh, briefly in Congress. Uh, so she's someone who has made it her business in recent months and years to travel the state, get to know people. Uh, so she's going to have a very brief tenure unless she does run for her own term as governor. There's only a year or so left in Cuomo's term. Uh, so she has that short time to position herself if she indeed wants to succeed him for a full term. What do you think about next year? I know it's early, but, uh, you know, possession is nine tenths of the law, right? So she'll have a year in, in the position. And there's also Letitia James, who's uh, reportedly interested in running as well. Exactly. The attorney general who led this investigation against Andrew Cuomo uh, got a lot of publicity out of it, got a lot of goodwill from women and others around the state. Uh, and so I think you, you will find that uh, these those are the two obvious candidates for the Democratic nomination for governor uh, in the coming uh, in, in that next gubernatorial race. Uh, but it's up really up to Kathy Hochul to see what she can do against some very stiff challenges, including the resurgence of the, the uh, COVID uh, right. pandemic and and the, the Delta situation, something that Andrew Cuomo got tremendous credit for his work on. Now it's really going to be up to Kathy Hochul to see how she can handle this next surge. All eyes on the Empire State. Mark Fisher, Washington Post senior editor. Thanks for your time, Mark. We appreciate it. Most welcome. The battle between Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and mask mandates continues. This time he's taking on schools and threatening to withhold pay. How are teachers responding? And in Oregon, the governor is putting a pause on testing standards for high school students. What's behind this decision to drop proficiency standards in reading, writing, and math? I'll speak with the former school superintendent ahead. And don't forget to follow us on social media at The Donlin Report on Twitter. The school year is just around the corner, and whether students will have to wear masks is fresh on the minds of parents and educators across the nation. Governor Ron DeSantis has been one of the most vocal critics of mask mandates in schools. Now he's threatening to withhold the pay of superintendents and school board members at districts that require them. News Nation correspondent Brian Enton live for us in Palm Beach County, Florida, with more on this mask debate. Good evening, Brian. 
Good evening, Joe. Yeah, this mask mandate debate really getting wild down here. You mentioned it yesterday. Governor DeSantis said any district that puts a mask mandate in place, he said he could cut their funding and cut the salaries of the superintendents and board members. Well, today, the White House responded and said if DeSantis does that, they could then turn around and use federal COVID money, money to then refund those districts and get the superintendents and the school leaders paid. Also today, you you have uh, Democrats here in Florida who have literally started GoFundMe pages raising money just in case Governor DeSantis ends up cutting the funding to some of these school districts. This is what the governor said today. We're going to do whatever we can to vindicate the rights of, of parents and make sure that parents are in the driver's seat when it comes to the, the health, education, and welfare of their kids. And take a look at this. The superintendent of Miami-Dade County Schools, that is the fourth biggest school district in the entire country, released a statement. He says, at no point shall I allow my decision to be influenced by a threat to my paycheck, a small price to pay considering the gravity of this issue and the potential impact to the health and well-being of our students and dedicated employees. So obviously these superintendents really put in a very interesting position right now, Joe. That's one, Brian. What do you you hearing maybe from some of these other districts ultimately what are they going to do well different districts have different plans you have many who are just complying with DeSantis you have others like Broward County one of the biggest districts in the state today they voted and said yes we are going to have a mandate they plan to possibly uh, take DeSantis to court and then where we are Palm Beach County they started a uh, school today their superintendent decided that he would have uh, a mask mandate but and this is an important but he had an opt-out clause uh, so if parents sent their kid to school with a note they didn't have to wear a mask. This is what the superintendent here today said. As a superintendent, how do you feel about the governor mandating how you can make decisions here locally? You know, it's the health conditions are local, so it'd be nice to have more local control. But I'm a, I was sworn <laughs> sworn in as a constitutional officer to abide by the law of the land, and, and I'm going to do that. So he sort of said uh, he feels like he has his hands tied. An interesting side note, Joe, we were inside the schools today in, in Palm Beach County. They started school today. I would say about 95%, maybe more of the kids, all had masks on. That's an interesting update, Brian. I mean, you're talking about GoFundMe to pay for your superintendents. Uh, that, that's uh, taking an interesting yeah. turn. Brian, thanks for the update. Well, it's assumed that a high school graduate would be proficient in reading, writing, and math, and most schools obviously make sure of that. But for the next three years, schools in Oregon will not be guaranteeing graduates know those simple and essential skills. Those proficiency tests are being put on pause so lawmakers can develop new graduation standards. It's part of an effort to increase the fairness of standardized testing. Welcome in now, our voice on a lot of education issues, Paul Vallis. He ran school districts in four states, including st uh, cities like Chicago, Philadelphia, and New Orleans. So Paul, it's good to see you again. What's with the situation in Oregon, putting this on pause for three years, essentially to study graduation requirements? What do you make of this? Well, I think uh, if you recall, I think Oregon's one of the last states to actually reopen their schools. That's right. And I think it's a convenient way for them to kind of like cover up the damage that's been done for schools having been closed for so long. So, um, you know, anytime you, you reduce standards, you end up dumbing down the curriculum and that helps everyone, particularly that hurts everyone, particularly poor children. I also think it's driven by this uh, national campaign on the part of the teacher unions to basically reduce testing and to reduce accountability. If you're not testing, you're not evaluating, you can't tell how well the schools are doing. You can't tell how effective the teachers are. So I think it's a, it's a, it, it, it's a big mistake. Well, the other optics on this, Paul, that were interesting was that it was signed sort of quietly. There was right. said to be a glitch, I guess, that kept it off the books for a number of weeks. So the optics of this aren't great. Why not celebrate it if this is something they, they believe in and want to stand by? Well, clearly they were trying to downplay it. And let me point out that, uh, you know, you can test and not punish because of the testing. Because, you know, these tests can give you a sense of how well the children are doing and how, right. how effective your is. So you use them as diagnostic tools. So um, I really think this is driven by the fact that Oregon, like many, many other states, uh, I mean, they did serious damage by not aggressively uh, reopening their schools when all the science and all the experience of schools that had reopened indicated 
that you could reopen the full schedules with the proper masking and the proper social distancing with minimal health care implications. The other thing that's interesting about this, Paul, you mentioned it. I mean, you have these tests now that are, are either going to be paused or suspended or waived. You're, you're going to be given credit for the credits that you've accumulated in high school. But now a lot of colleges as well are not requiring the ACT or the SAT. To your point, how are schools and students and states supposed to sort of get a gauge on how they're doing? Well, they don't. They, they, it's a radical drift away. I remember when I took responsibility for the Chicago Public Schools uh, back in 1995, 80% of the children who had been who had graduated into high school were reading at the sixth grade reading level. So I had an obligation to assess and evaluate how those children were doing mm -hmm. so that I could determine what interventions were most appropriate. So I, I just think they're moving in the, uh, the opposite direction. But I do want to say something really quick. What sure. they're doing is they're studying doing the tough things and doing the tough things are things like extending the school day extending the instructional the school a year so that you can provide more instructional time on task which is one of the silver bullets when it comes to helping children who are falling academically behind and they're you know and and the needed work to go in and to assess those schools that are not effective determine why they're not effective and do the proper reconstitution hey paul before we let you go i know you were probably listening when we talked about these threats from uh, the governor in florida about withholding pay if a school district were to yeah so so what would you do if you were a superintendent and you heard this well, look, uh, our governor basically said everybody masks. That, that includes parochial and private schools. And incidentally, the, the, basically they said because COVID is rising, even though the actual number of, of kids who are be, being infected with COVID is significantly down, there's just a higher percentage of the new COVID cases because the kids are not vaccinated where the adults are. But my position is it should be a local control issue. It should absolutely be a local control. So I don't agree with Pritzker or DeSantos. You leave it up to the superintendents and their elected school boards to make that determination. Every district is different. Are you worried at all, Paul, about what we're heading into here as the school year starts in a, in a couple of weeks in a lot of areas? By that, I mean, are you worried about a kid in third grade, now he tests positive. Now you're going to have to do the contact tracing, and now you're going to have quarantines. And, and we kind of thought we were past this, and we were hoping to get back in person uh, without even masks, perhaps. But it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Well, look, I think the teachers' unions are going to use this as a reason to uh, delay the opening of schools mm. or to insist that their members be allowed to work remotely if they intend to. You already see Randy Weingarten saying, hey, not so fast, we may not be able to open or we have to get all the teachers vaccinated. And in Chicago, the teachers union and th those schools were closed for 12 consecutive months with no in-school instruction. They're basically saying that if the, if, if the Delta variant, the infection rate continues to rise, we may not open schools in September and, mm. or in August. And that would be an absolute disaster. Well, well, that's something we'll certainly keep our eye on. Paul Val, it's always good to have your voice on education issues, and it's always good to see you, my friend. Take care. Thanks for having me. A chilling report released this week sounding the alarm on climate change, what the scientists say humans have to do now. We'll get into that. Plus, Governor Cuomo has resigned, but he's far from being out of the woods. I'll speak with a former staffer, Cassie Moreno, next about what she called the governor's toxic office. We want to pick back up now on the conversation about New York Governor Andrew Cuomo and his resignation today. Joining us now, a former staffer, Cassie Moreno. She comes in now for more perspective on what it's like to work in the governor's office. Cassie, thanks for your time. Let's start with your reaction to the governor's announcement today, knowing what you know about him and working in that office. Did it surprise you? Thank you so much for having me. Uh, his resignation actually did surprise me. I think everyone in New York politics was expecting this to be a battle through impeachment, uh, was expecting him to literally fight till he was the last man standing. He'd already lost his most senior advisor yesterday. Um, but I think everyone in the state of New York, in New York politics, including myself, was surprised uh, but relieved at this outcome. We should probably point out here too, Cassie, that you were not named in, in the attorney general's report, nor did you make any allegations against the governor, correct? That's correct. All right. So he apologized today, took responsibility, but but then said, I, I never crossed the line with anyone. What was your reaction when when you heard that? 
Right. So that's not an apology and he didn't take responsibility. Um, and furthermore, what he has done is use his staff and all of the resources available to him to undermine the women who have come forward, to leak uh, documents about them to the press, to uh, use his lawyer, who is a campaign paid lawyer, that he's given the pulpit of the official state of New York on those live feeds, uh, to using her to say that what he was doing uh, wasn't harassment. She wasn't arguing that he didn't do it. She was arguing that he did it and it's not grounds to remove him. Uh, and that includes touching a woman's breast, that includes running his hand up and down the backs of staffers. Um, he you know, gave someone all of the resources of New York to argue that that didn't matter. Did you ever talk to any of the staffers in the office about any of this, Cassie? Yeah, so I did. So I was in the office from January, or excuse me, from December of 2020 to January of 2021. So this past December and January. And I uh, had started work and about four days later, Lindsay Boylan's first allegations uh, became public, her very first tweets. And I brought them up at the time to, I, I waited a couple of days and expected some sort of HR meeting to happen. You know, I had just, just started, expected there would be some sort of all team meeting as they're typically is in these situations in political offices. And there was nothing, there was silence, except that there was a new section on the tracker for the press hits. And that was a section to monitor Lindsay Boylan. So um, at that time, I did bring up to a female staff member, someone who trained me, someone who's very close to my age, uh, that, you know, I was concerned about this. What did she think about this? Isn't, isn't, aren't we going to receive some sort of official update about this? And basically what she said was that as far as she was concerned, Lindsay Boylan was a liar who was interested in promoting her own political campaign and that that was the end of that and um that was really my signal to just shut up and fit in and not be a supporter of lindsey boylan even though of course i was and um to just do what they asked me to do which essentially was track her every word along with others what what did you uh what, what finally caused you to leave cassie I knew on day two that this was a horrible work environment and it took me two months. I had like also moved. It was also Christmas. There was all these things going on. It took me about two months to get a new position and leave. And I did so as soon as possible. Uh, started networking again as soon as possible. But of course, it's extremely hard to network for a new job in politics, especially when you're currently in a job. Right. So, uh, you know, I left as soon as I could. And it, it really was just the controlled environment, the way that we had to be on call from 5 a.m. to 1 a.m., mm -hmm. the way that you could get called to do anything at any time. You were told to bring your laptop to the grocery store. I was yelled at for going to a Christmas tree lighting mm. uh, because I wasn't on call and available to do work. It was over the holidays. I uh, had to work on Christmas, had to work while my family was visiting over Christmas. So it was really kind of looking, looking down the line and imagining the next two years of my life like this and saying, absolutely not. Are you out of the political game? No, I'm not. I, I currently work for myself as a Democratic communications consultant. All right, Cassie Moreno, former Cuomo staffer. Cassie, thanks for your time. Thank you so much. Good luck. Joining me now for some legal perspective on this, former New York State Supreme Court Judge Robert Holdman. It's always good to see the judge as well. All rise. So what happens now, Judge, from the legal side of this? How are you, Joe? I apologize for my attire. I'm on vacation. That's but, okay. uh... You don't wear your robe on vacation? <laughs> no, but I, I saw the Joe Donlan sign in the sky. I had to answer. So. <laughs> okay. What happens next on the criminal side, Judge? Well, you know, he's looking at investigations in five different counties. And um, there's an assortment of charges that uh, we can see that he's looking at. The two primary ones is the forcible touching, which is the A misdemeanor, and the sexual abuse in the third degree, which is a B misdemeanor. And, you know, so I think maybe the average average person who's not familiar with these uh, crimes might not understand some of it uh, unless they've dealt with it. Like sexual abuse in the third degree, which is the B misdemeanor, it's punishable mm -hmm. by 90 days in jail as the maximum. It's sexual contact without the other's consent. And sexual contact contact is defined as the touching of a sexual body part. All right, that's, that's the easy part, right? The mouth, the vagina, the derriere, the, the breast, the penis, the mouth, or other intimate parts for gratification of either party, even if it's over clothing. Mm -hmm. So that's where, as we've seen the allegations made by the state trooper, the running of the hand right. from the belly button to the hip, from the neck down to the back, that's inclusive. And forcible touching, which is an A misdemeanor, punishable up to a year in jail, 
is the intentional touching hmm. with no legitimate purpose other than gratifying sexual desire or the purpose of degrading someone. Right. Well, let's That's get cool. into some of the defense on this, Judge, because he said, if I offended anyone, I'm sorry. I thought it was a hug, just being friendly. What's your opinion of the defense he did offer today? I, I honestly, it's, it's, I'll be blunt with you, Joe. I think it's, it's a general, generational issue. I think the Italian defense that he has used in the past is insulting. I think the generational they do. One could make the argument: would a would a governor have been forced to resign as Cuomo was twenty years ago? Right. I don't. I yeah, don't think he. Would. I agree. Yeah. It doesn't mean the act would have been right. But right. you look at Clarence Thomas or Anita Hill. Clarence Thomas would not be on the Supreme Court today, yeah. based on the allegations that he faced. So his defense. I think, quite frankly, he's misguided in using those defense because they don't fit. Yeah, let me get you on one other bigger picture issue, and that, and that is he, he talked about this being the result of bias and a lack of fairness in the judicial system. What would you say to that when you heard it? it it's, it's a reach because who, who did he expect to do this? He didn't control this. He has, uh, quite frankly, a history of wanting to control whatever investigations were done. You know, it said that he called the White House when he disbanded the Moreland Commission in the Southern District, looked into why he disbanded it. He wanted no part of that. Mm. So he couldn't control this. It wasn't his people. He said, it, so of course he's gonna say it's bias. I, I, I think that's part of the reach and part of the defense that his attorneys are going with. Yeah. Hey, before you go, Judge, uh, what do you think of the states banning these mask mandates? You've heard what's happened in Florida. Uh, would that hold up in your court? <laughs> again, you're trying to get after me, Joe. I, I, I like to try to pin me down. Listen, again, it, what do we do here as we do in all these situations is you weigh the government's interest in imposing the safety versus the mm -hmm. imposition of the civil liberties of forcing or not forcing someone to wear a mask. And that's what a judge has to look to. And we're starting in these kind of challenges to push the envelope on either side of that scale. Or leaving it up to the local districts and the municipalities to make the decision in some cases, which has happened already in Texas, I believe. Yes, exactly. And then, and then you're going to get more all politics is local, right? Yeah. All right, uh, Judge Robert Holdman, again, it's always good to see you. And I am surprised you don't bring your Fordham helmet with you on vacation. That's the main <laughs> state. my heart, though, Joe. Always I know, my heart. you know it is. Judge, good to see you. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Before we go to break, former Illinois Governor Rob Lagojevich weighed in on Andrew Cuomo on Twitter saying, quote, he didn't do anything wrong, but then he quit. What? New Yorkers are tough, but quitting when you say you didn't do anything wrong isn't New York tough? You can catch more with Blago tonight. He's going to be on Banfield, 10 Eastern, 9 Central, right here on News Nation. The United Nations has a warning for everyone. Climate change is happening. The bleak future some of the world's top scientists expect. And why not everyone is sold on the idea? Plus, the Senate has passed an infrastructure package, and it wasn't on party lines, but is there some fat to be cut out of that trillion dollar bipartisan bill? We'll take a look at that next. This is a plan to invest in the American people in their future and their success. Today, I'm happy to mark this significant milestone on the road toward making what we all know are long overdue much needed investments in basic hard infrastructure of this nation. President Biden, they're talking about the Senate's passage of the $1 trillion infrastructure bill. The bill was passed in a bipartisan vote with 19 Republicans joining Democrats. Those who didn't join their colleagues say the bill is filled with wasteful spending. But is that the case? News Nation's Joe Khalil spent the day looking into the pork in this bill. What'd you find, Joe? You know, Joe, I mean, the traditional idea of abusive pork spending, not a huge issue when it comes to this bill. There were a couple little things that we found. It's not a coincidence that uh, Joe Manchin's wife running the Appalachian Commission uh, is going to get some money from this bill. He was key in negotiating uh, this $1.2 trillion bill. And there's some more money for, you know, salmon preservation in Alaska. Lisa Murkowski State, also a key negotiator here. Um, but there is some outrage in, you know, the overall spending on this and more, more importantly on that three and 
a half trillion dollar package, Joe. But when it comes to the pork uh, spending itself, a lot of that isn't nearly what it used to be, you know, in the, in the last uh, decade or so. Right. But I'm guessing, as you alluded, there is probably some in this three point five trillion dollar budget, if not uh, pork, at, at least disputed, shall we say? There's I mean, there's a lot of outrage. And, you know, look, the, a three and a half trillion dollar price tag was unthinkable just a couple of years ago. And if you're a Republican watching what's in this package, I mean, it, it frankly is an expansion of the social safety net in this country. It is basically a list of democratic priorities. I mean, take your pick. It's um, immigration reform. It's uh, expanded paid leave, expanded Medicare, two years of free community college. Uh, it's universal pre-K. There's a ton of money for uh, climate investment and for green energy. And so, yeah, if you're a Republican, there's a lot of concern there that Democrats are just trying to achieve a whole list of their agenda items all in one fell swoop in this big, massive package. And they're also worried, again, about uh, the pay force that Democrats have described. Right. All right. Well, we'll continue to follow it. Joe Khalil live for us tonight in D.C. Good to see you, Joe. Thanks. The United Thanks, Nations is out with a new report on the impacts of climate change. The report, which is based on an analysis of more than 14,000 studies, lays out how humans have contributed to climate change and what humans can do to slow it down in the future. The report says no matter what we do, things like extreme droughts, severe heat, flooding, and other weather patterns will continue for the next 30 years. Joining me now is climate change skeptic and author of The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. We talk with him often. He's Alex Epstein because he does have a contrarian view, and we want to tap into that again tonight, Alex. We don't have any uh, climate change experts for you to body slam. It's just little old me. Um, you're the expert. No, I'm not. So give us one well, reason. I'm a, I'm a climate. Well, first of all, I'm a climate catastrophe skeptic. I'm not a climate <laughs> change skeptic. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. So, so this UN report is called uh, Code Red for Humanity. Uh, give me one thing you disagree with on it. Well, let's just start off with that's not what the report is called. It's called the Assessment Report Working Group 1 for the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. <laughs> no, I said the it's code being red, called. Yeah, yeah. Well, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, but it's interesting. So it's being called that by the head of the UN, Antonio Guterres. Um, and it's so there are two things going on. One is what he's how he's characterizing it and how most of the media are characterizing it is a total distortion of the report. Uh, but then I think the, the report itself is very biased. And so that's how I think what happens is the report itself only looks for negative side effects from fossil fuels and tends to exaggerate them. It totally ignores the benefits, which I'll argue are a much better world overall, and specifically a world that's far safer from climate, which is one thing even the UN reports, let alone the media, mm -hmm. uh, don't mention. And so when you do, the report itself is a distortion, but the media goes crazy. They act like, oh, it says that we have to eliminate fossil fuels immediately. The report says no such thing. The report is basically a pretty extreme amount of speculation about an amount of warming that even if it did happen, human beings would be totally fine because we're so adaptable. So right. I, I don't disagree that we're impacting climate. Okay. I disagree with this idea that it's immoral and catastrophic. What I'm confused about, Alex, is that, I mean, we, we all sort of feel like we're doing our part where we can. Uh, and I think, you know, we've got uh, Joe Biden calling for 50% of car sales to be electric by 2030, and we're, we're trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 or whatever. At the end of the day, though, is there really anything more that we can do? Is this not a state issue? Is it not a nation issue? Is it not an industrial issue? Well, it depends what you mean by we're trying to do these things. Because I think that if we actually achieved anything close to net zero by 2050, billions of people would literally be dead uh, prematurely. I think there is no conception of how valuable fossil fuels are to today's world. It's important that we live in the most livable world ever, and that is only possible because machines do so much work for us. And fossil fuels, they're the low cost, reliable sources of energy that feed the machines for billions of people. So without fossil fuels, you have no development, no infrastructure that protects you from climate. You have to live with the natural climate. You try to, fill eight, you try to feed 8 billion people without fossil fuels, there's no way. So all right. of these measures are incredibly destructive. So I don't think we should be taking these steps. The steps we should be taking are empower the world. Nobody's talking about billions of people lacking energy. And so my basic issue here is people are thinking the whole goal is let's not impact the climate. And my goal is no, let's empower the world. Any impact on the climate will be totally masterable. But if we don't empower the world, people will continue to suffer and die unnecessarily. Can we say how can we impact the planet less? 
no, you shouldn't think in terms of imp- so that's that's this religious dogma that we shouldn't impact the planet, and that's why I think this is a religious or philosophical. Not at issue. all. I mean, no. less though, Alex. No, 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 no. But look, but does that you impact the planet every time you build something, every time you drive a car? You shouldn't. Human beings, we want to intelligently impact the planet. So I'm for positively impacting the planet. You want to avoid uh, negative impacts. You want to avoid unnecessary pollution. If you're concerned about CO2, then you should be really in favor of nuclear energy. And I think mm. it's very revealing that the people who are most against fossil fuels and claim that they care about climate catastrophe, they're against nuclear. They're against hydro, uh-huh. and they even stop the development of solar and wind. So uh-huh. I, I maintain this is a religious, anti-human impact movement, not a scientific movement. Always give us something to think about, Alex. It's good to see you. Take care. Thank you. As we head to break, we've lost a couple of legends in the sports world. First, Hall of Fame goaltender Tony Esposito. He was acquired by the Chicago Blackhawks in 1969, won the Vesna Trophy as the best goaltender in the NHL three times, elected to the Hall of Fame in 1988. I got to meet Tony in 2018. When I was playing street hockey as a kid, if I was in the net, I was Tony Esposito. Number 35 was 78 years old. Also this, Bob Jenkins, one of the greatest voices of racing in IndyCar, died yesterday at the age of 73. Jenkins' career lasted more than 50 years with his last call coming in 2012 after he retired to help his ailing wife, Pam, who was diagnosed with brain cancer. Jenkins revealed in February that he himself was diagnosed with brain cancer. We'll send you to break with a clip of his call of the 1994 Indy 500. History in the making, car 31. That number scoring at first win and Mercedes-Benz in its very first race. Something to think about on the way out. Following the January 6th Capitol riot, Congress passed a new law aimed at protecting the Capitol from future attacks. The total cost, $2.1 billion. Certainly a lot of taxpayer money. And a federal judge in D.C. is wondering why the rioters aren't footing more of the bill for the damage. Chief U.S. District Judge Beryl Howell asked why the Capitol rioters only being charged $2,000 each, totaling just under $1.5 million. Will it matter where the money comes from? A riot and takeover of the Capitol has led to a $2.1 billion security upgrade, including the damages caused against a $1.5 million fine for rioters. As we know, in the end, looks like we'll all be paying for it. On Balance is next. <laughs> 